we've got to get way, way faster at developing better medicines and new medicines. So by the end of the time today with me here, I want us all to understand why that's important and how we can make that happen. Let's start with a pop quiz. So everyone raise your hands. This is a different kind of pop quiz. You're going to raise your hands because you already know the answer. Get them up. Get them up. And if you don't know the answer, you can put your hand down. So everyone's going to be starting off as A students. OK, question one. How many of you can name a place where you can buy a fast food burger? Great. OK, <laughs> question two. How many of you know can name, how many of you can name a place where you can buy a pack of cigarettes? Wow, smart and unhealthy. <laughs> um, let's try one more. How many of you know, how many of you can name a physician who's participating or conducting a clinical trial? Not so smart. Some of you are, so that's good. So by the end of today, I want you to all be able to care enough about this thing called clinical research or clinical trials so you can raise your hands. Um, and I'll start, I'll, I'll start this with a, with a demonstration. Because I believe nobody cares about a clinical trial, but we all need to. And I'll make it very personal to you. Women in the audience, please stand up in your chairs. Get the blood moving. Just take a stand. Women, great, great. I'm going to eyeball this. The lights are a little bright. So everyone from the third row over this way, please have a seat. Okay, you can sit down. The third column, sorry, that way, have a seat. The rest of you stay standing. Those of you can look at those people who are standing. And according to the American Cancer Association, if the women in this audience represent the US population of women, these women will develop cancer. OK, you can sit down. That is scary to me. That keeps me up at night. Those are sobering statistics. Men, you're not off the hook. Gentlemen, please rise. OK. If you're on this side of the, uh, uh, the, the, the venue, have a seat. The rest of you stay standing. Those of you who are sitting, look at those guys over there. American Cancer Association says one in two will develop cancer in their lifetime. This is very real. These are sobering. You can have a seat now, thanks. I'll do one more. Um, if, you're, if you're sensitive about your age, feel free to sit out, but I think it's important. Um, those of you who are at least 50 years old, up to 55 years old, uh, could you please stand? Could you please stand? Okay, I'm going to eyeball this. Wow, there's more than I thought. <laughs> All right, I'm going to say there's, th let's say there's 30. Two of you, if, again, it's, this ref represents the U.S. population, two of you will develop dementia when you hit the age of 65. The Alzheimer's Society tells us it's 1 in 14. When you hit the age of 80, that risk actually more than doubles. You can have a seat. So those of you in that 50 to 55 age group might say, ah, 65, it's a long ways away. I got time. You guys are going to develop something new and improved. So by the time I'm 65, a new drug will be on the market. And that is true, except that drug is likely very, very old. The fact of the matter is the drugs that are discovered today, literally today, won't be ready for use for 10 or 15 years. That's old medical technology that you'll be using to fight a disease you have today or tomorrow. What does old technology look like? Here's a cell phone <laughs> from about 15 years ago. I doubt anybody in this room will use this to manage their digital lives yet we'll settle for old technology to manage our human lives. So now you might be thinking, Joe, why does this take so long? Simple question with actually a very simple answer. Uh, but I need to give you a little bit of context. So let's say this line represents the time it takes to discover a drug, test it, file it, get it approved, and make it available. So day one, drug discovery, great job. At the end, you've done all your testing, you file the results with the FDA, uh, and then shortly thereafter, there's, there's approval. 
and then some other stuff happens and you can get it, get it, uh, make it available. In the middle, um, so and let's say this takes the sort of 15 year time frame. That's 5,500 days. In the middle, there's a big chunk that's about human testing. It's a giant chunk of this whole red line, actually. How long does this take? Well, it varies. It can take anywhere um, in upwards of seven years or more, just the human testing part of it. So you've discovered it before, you've got to test it on, a, on some humans, and then you um, can file it. So why does that take so long? Let me give you a little bit more context so you understand. It's a very simple question, the very simple answer, um, but I need to give you a little bit more detail. There is something called clinical development. Clinical just means human. So clinical development is all the human testing, and it's broken up into a bunch of different kinds of trials, and they're split up into three phases. It's not that mysterious, right? You can all follow this. Phase one's pretty straightforward. Forget if, forget if this drug is even gonna work. Is it safe to put in a human body? And we're really looking for two things. Researchers are looking for what does the drug do to the body? What does the body do to the drug? And some other stuff around that. Doses are jacked up pretty high because we need to see exactly when this drug actually hurts you, and that's important. Um, volunteers are brave. Uh, they're quite eager to enroll. They're uh, compensated in a, in a way commensurate with their sacrifice to some degree. They could be more well honored, uh, but that's another talk. Uh, and we only need to enroll, you know, a few dozen of these. And actually, that part actually goes pretty quickly. Phase two is really where it starts to grind to a halt. So now we know that the, the, the prospective drug might not uh, hurt you, so now that we need to see if it works. We need to know how much we need to give, when to give it, in what kind of patients, in what kind of disease, right? Cancer is not just one disease, it's a lot of different ones. And can we find a way to measure if it works or not? And can we do all this without, can we do all this and control things like chance or other weird influences that might happen. So let me give you an example. If you were trying to do a taste test between Coke and Pepsi, and you wanted to prove that one was better than the other, there's lots of things you could do to sort of mess up the results, right? You could forget to cover up the cans. You could uh, get tasters who uh, don't like one soft drink or the other. You could get them who, uh, tasters who maybe had too much to eat or didn't eat at all. Um, so there's lots of different things you can, you can screw up the results with. You also need a lot of people. You can't just do a taste test between Coke and Pepsi with two tasters, right? How many do you need? I don't know if you need a million, but you need enough of them so you have something called statistical significance around why one is going to be better than the other. In phase two research for drugs, we only typically need a few hundred patients, to, uh, volunteers. Now that's not a lot, but for some reason it takes a long time. Let's go to phase three. So phase, by phase three, you know how much of the drug to give, who to give it in, what the, the, the disease is, and, and many other things. So now it's about broadening the volunteer base. Let's make a more heterogeneous crowd to get inspired to come try it out. This might require enrolling a few thousand patients. Not that long, but for some reason, it takes a long time. in upwards of seven years or more, just to do the testing. Meanwhile, patients are waiting. So a drug that's discovered today isn't ready in five years, it's not ready in 10 years. A drug that's discovered in 2015 may not be ready for another 15 years. 2030, did I do the math right? I think so. Because no one knows about a clinical trial, so no one cares. And we all need to care about this, right? Those statistics in the beginning, Right? There's a lot of people in here you know that we're standing. I'm one of them. Right? So we need to care about a clinical trial. And when people care about things, amazing things end up happening. So I'll give you some examples of, of when people care about something. Nine million iPhone 5s sold in three days. They just broke the record with the iPhone 6. Here's another example of people caring. For some reason, 17 million people cared enough about the movie 22 Jump Street and coordinated to see it in a weekend without even talking to each other. <laughs> Enough people cared about Justin Bieber, so he sold 40,000 seats at Madison Square Garden. Sold it out twice in 30 seconds. 
right? And then he sold his whole tour in like under an hour. It was crazy. Last month, I looked up a trial in clinicaltrials.gov uh, looking to enroll just 800 volunteers in an Alzheimer's study. From what I can tell, that study is still enrolling after two years. This drug that could help people is still waiting for volunteers to come in. 800, that's all we need. So yeah, I get it, it takes two to tango. It's not just about patients caring. I like to quote a popular urban poet from New York City. It takes two to make a thing go right. <laughs> it takes two to make it out of sight. <laughs> yes, I did go there. Uh, so it's not just about getting beaten overhead with public service announcements. It's not just me up here talking to you about how important it is, how personal it can be. You have a dance partner with two left feet. You have many dance partners with two left feet. Physicians, hospitals, FDA, drug companies. So at Eli Lilly, we're trying to work up some new dance moves, and we're going to get really good at them. There's one in particular I'd like to, to uh, talk to you about. The U.S. government, the FDA, requires that most clinical research, nearly all of it, gets to, needs to be registered on a site called clinicaltrials.gov. It's actually not that useful to patients and physicians because physicians, um, and many physicians have reported, that it can take an upwards of two hours to look at a patient's medical record and compare it to what's on clinicaltrials.gov to see if they actually match, if that eligibility matches up with what they're looking for. So if that doesn't happen, then, then what? You have to go back to the drawing board. Um, Oddly enough, there's lots of human-readable information here uh, on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, but it's so inconsistent and so vast in volume, it's actually not that useful to humans. So what we're working on at uh, Lilly is a colleague of mine, his name is Tom, is working on an open platform at Eli Lilly to be able to pull all this data in, make it consistent, structured, normalized, standard, so that we can make it machine-readable. That is, you can use the power of computing to match patients with perspe perspective research. Our vis vision is to allow uh, finding a suitable study as easy as it is to find a hotel room in any city. So you might be thinking, Joe, you're young, you look fairly healthy, why do you care so much about this? Well, as I talked about in the beginning, I won't always be, so it's that. And two, it's not just me. I'm a spouse, I'm a son, I'm a father, I'm a friend. So I have people that I care about. And we all have people that we care about. And these people get sick. So can we motivate ourselves to care more about clinical research so we can cut this time in half? Develop the next generation of medicines faster and faster? Get something new on the market that's discovered today, not in, not in 15 years, not in seven years, Five years, that would be great. And before you think this is like too much of a problem to overcome and you, you, know, you don't have any money or whatever, uh, it's actually very easy. This isn't like climate change or an asteroid. All you have to do is care enough about clinical research to start asking about it a little bit more and more. So who's gonna, who's gonna fix these brutal diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, autoimmune, rare? It's not gonna be doctors. It's not going to be drug companies. It's everyone here in this room and everybody else you know. So before I close, I just want to inspire you to do two things. What can you do? Uh, a, if you have uh, an, an idea, uh, a way to help connect patients with research and make that more rapid, contact me, literally. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. It's my full-time job. This is what I'm supposed to do. But two, if you have a healthcare decision that you need to make, ask yourself, ask your doctor, ask Google, ask your patient community, is there a clinical trial I can participate in? Because by doing so, it will allow us all to live better, happier lives, allow us to see more rock concerts with our friends. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? Thank you.